I think it must be audible now. Fine. So I mean, sorry, I didn't switch on the audio. So I think it, this, it must be audible by now. Yeah. Thank you. I think call the audio visual aids are fine. Okay. Okay. So let me just uh, go ahead with and start what I wanted to start. Let me open the chat box only to before starting the session. Mm -hmm. I think the audio visual aids are clear. So without any problem. Audio lights are clear, so without any problem. So today we're going to start with cardiology. So I'll just write cardiology. So you can see all the letters properly, right? So cardiology. This is what we're going to start with. Okay. So audio visual are clear. So the, no, there is no background noise. The visuals are clear. So let me show you some images before starting. So can you see these pictures properly? No problem. All the pictures. Right. Can you see these pictures properly? Yes. Thank you. So those are the pictures I'm going to use today. So that's why I uh, wanted to show in the first place. Okay, fine. So what we want to really discuss, let me take the chat box out separately. so that I can uh, have a continuous view of you all. Okay, so I, I'm going to start with the ECG. And even before starting with the ECG, I'm going to start with uh, something called the coronary artery disease and the ischemic heart disease. So the, usually that is where I start with most of the times. So that's what I wanted to do in the first place. Then after this, I'll be uh, going ahead with the heart failure part. And maybe later on, uh, we can discuss about some other topics at the end of the cardiology session as well. So ECG is something really big. And uh, if you get some few questions on uh, you know, like cardiology, and it will be one of the questions will be on ECG. And of course, they'll concentrate a lot on the coronary artery disease part as well. So to start with, I'm going to start with the coronary blood flow first. I'm not going to discuss in detail because this is uh, something like what you need to know for the exam. So let us keep it precise and uh, up to the point. So when you talk about a coronary blood flow to start with, and that's why I have an outline of the heart because you are going to tell me, so what are the coronary vessels that we have and how they're going to course in the first place. So let me start with that in the first place, the anatomy part. So we have two coronary arteries we know. One is the right coronary artery and second is the left coronary artery. Uh, can anyone tell where the coronary start from? So now you can answer. Yes, uh, there is an area that is the aortic root. That's where the coronary arteries are going to start from. So there is an area called sinus of Valsalva. I think you will be aware of that. So I'll draw the sinus of Valsalva after some time uh, because it is behind the aortic valves. So from the sinus of Valsalva, you have uh, three important sinuses. One is called a right coronary sinus. Next is called the left coronary sinus. And the third one we obviously called as something called a non-coronary sinus. So from the left coronary sinus, you're going to get the left coronary artery. So start with, so let us assume this is a left coronary artery. I am going to write as LMCA from now on, that is left main coronary artery, or you can call this as LMS, left main stem as well. The part which I have drawn right now is what I'm going to call it as LMCA. And from the LMCA, you're going to get two different vessels. So one is going to be the circumflex, of course, so even though I'm not drawing the exact anatomical boundaries, I'm not a, a teacher of anatomy. So just I want to make the 
uh, you know, like the situation and the concept clear. So that's what the most important thing is. So then you're going to get the left anterior dizzying artery. So let me draw here. So this is going to be the left anterior dizzying artery, which is again divided into something called uh, proximal LAD. Then you have a mid LAD. Then you're going to have something called a distal left anterior dizzying artery. So as far as the LAD is concerned, so they're going to go into the apex and they're going to wind up and they will supply a little bit of the inferior wall as well. Not too much of the inferior wall, but little bit of the inferior wall will be uh, supplied by the left anterior descending artery as well. And we do have a lot of branches that are going to come out of the left anterior descending artery. The first one being uh, something called a diagonal branch. So let me draw like this. So you have a D1, for example, a diagonal branch. Then you have something called a septal branch. So let us uh, give the name called S1. Then you tend to have other septal branches, other diagonal branches, D2, and so on. So you might have multiple septal branches and you might have multiple diagonal branches as well. As you curve around, so this is what we refer to as a left circumflex artery. So if I want to draw a little neater, so this will be the left main stem. And from this, your LAD branches and the left circumflex branches. Let me show the LAD. This is the LAD, and this is going to be the left circumflex branch. And from the circumflex, you know, like this circumflex is going to curve around on the posterior side. So they are going on the posterior side. So let me draw it in uh, dotted lines like this as they curve around the posterior side of the heart and move behind. And they're going to uh, give rise to a variety of arteries. And these branches are typically referred to as something called posterior left ventricular branches. So I can draw as PLV. So let me call as PLV. So these are the posterior left ventricular branches. And on the other hand, they are also going to supply the lateral wall of the left ventricle through something called uh, obtuse marginal branches. So let me write this as obtuse marginal branches. Uh, so now the you know like idea is very clear. So what the left coronary, I mean left uh, circumflex is supplying. So left circumflex is basically supplying the lateral wall of the left ventricle. You can see this is the lateral surface of the left ventricle. So that will be supplied by the coronary uh, left circumflex, especially the obtuse marginal branch of the left circumflex. Then it will be supplied by the, uh, you know, like the posterior wall is also supplied uh, to a large extent by the left circumflex, as you can see by the posterior left ventricular branches. And uh, the left anterior descending artery is predominantly concerned with supplying the anterior part of the left ventricle, you can see here. And the apex is one of the diagonal branches of the LAD will be supplying the apex. And it can wrap around a little bit and can supply the inferior wall of the left ventricle to some extent. And uh, typically, you know, like how much it's going to supply is going to depend on a person to person. So that's an anatomical variation which you cannot really predict. And these diagonal branches are the major sources of blood supply for the anterior wall of the left ventricle. And we know, as the name su suggests, this S1 and S2, these are the septal branches which are really going to supply the septum, especially we call it as the basal septum or we call it as the upper two-third of the septum, so which will be supplied by the septal branches of the left anterior descending artery. So then let us start with uh, our uh, right coronary artery. So where the right coronary artery is going to originate from? From the right coronary sinus, which I'll be drawing in some time. Don't worry about that. So right coronary artery originates from the right coronary sinus and they go around the right atrium and uh, they're going to wind up around the heart. And before they wind up uh, to the posterior side of the heart, they're going to give rise to multiple different arteries. For example, let us assume this is a conus segment. There's a conus artery. And then you have an SA nodal branch and a right atrial branch will be there. So that will be supplying the SA node and the right atrium. While they wind up around the posterior side, they are going to give rise to multiple other branches. So these are maybe one or many branches can be that these are nothing but uh, the acute marginal branches. If you really see what are these branches, these acute marginal branches are the ones that are going to supply the main uh, substance of the right ventricle. The wall of the right ventricle is basically supplied by the uh, acute marginal branches only. And after this, you have this right I mean right coronary artery that is uh, going on the posterior side. So as uh, I told you before, the posterior side will be uh, denoted by dotted lines. So as they go, and they will be giving rise to multiple different arteries. So one of the most important uh, arteries is going to be something called as a PDA. So this one is what uh, I denoted as the PDA, that is the posterior descending artery. And they give rise to another a branch called AV nodal artery, which will not be seen in angiogram most of the times. And at the same time, they're also going to give rise to multiple different vessels like posterior left ventricular branches as well.
So you do have posterior left ventricular branches here. All right. So what are the uh, supply of the right coronary artery to be precise? So they're going to supply major part of the right atrium, all right. They are supplying both the SA node as well as the AV node, right? So both the SA node and AV node predominantly are supplied by the right coronary artery only. And at the same time, they are going to supply the main substance of the right ventricle through this acute marginal branches that you can see here. And majority of the posterior wall and uh, inferior wall and almost all of the inferior wall is supplied by the posterior descending artery only. And these posterior left ventricular branches are going to anastomose with the left coronary circulation with the left circumflex to be precise to produce, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, like major anastomotic site for the LCA versus the RCA. So this is the anatomy that we are really dis I mean, discussing till now. So let us move on and uh, see what we have learned till now. Okay, the coronary blood flow, we know, you know like uh, it's a common notion that the coronary blood flow is supposed to happen uh, in the diastole. So that's what you will be hearing. So diastole is where the coronary blood flow happens. But we all know that uh, it's not only in the diastole, the coronary blood flow tends to happen during the systole as well. So remember the fact that uh, Systole does contribute to the coronary blood flow because they do form something called eddy currents around the sinus of Alsalva, and that is going to really result in the blood flow during the systole as well. But traditionally, physiology textbooks have been uh, known for telling that the coronary blood flows are going to happen only during diastole, but not during the systole. So, but let us see the relative percentages of how much of blood flow is going to happen during the diastole and how much of blood flow is going to happen during the systole. So, as far as the LC is concerned, 70% of the uh, flow is going to happen during this systole, I mean diastole, and 30 percentage is going to happen during the systole. And as far as the right coronary artery is concerned, it's going to be around 50 50 percentage, which means half of the blood flow is going to happen during systole itself for the right coronary artery, which means as far as the right coronary artery is concerned, there is not much difference between the systole and the diastole, which means systole is also equally important in contributing to the blood flow. So, what is the reason why uh, systole is not contributing substantially as far as the left coronary circulation is concerned. It all depends on the, uh, I mean, the type of blood flow. So how the blood flow is distributed in the coronaries, in the blood, in the myocardium. So that's what this image is going to show. So where you are clearly seeing that when you take a cross section, when you're taking a cross section from the myocardial wall, what you're really seeing here is that uh, the vessels are basically epicardial. So as I used to tell multiple times, the vessels are on the epicardial side. So if you want to draw here, the vessels will be at this part. And we talk about the major coronaries. Uh, that is the left circumflex, LAD, left anti-descending, and we have the right coronary artery. And all these are going to really uh, well on the surface of the heart. These are called the epicardial surface, and that's why they are called as the epicardial coronaries or epicardial vessels. And they are going to give rise to these kind of microcirculation. So they penetrate the myocardium and they're going to supply the interior of the myocardium. And they don't go up till the endocardium, but they just end at the subendocardial portion. And one more important thing that you can note here is the fact that these are the conduction fibers. So what I'm marking in blue right now are the conduction fibers right now. And these conduction fibers are basically located on the subendocardial portion. That's really, really important to understand as well. So that has a lot of implications when you're when you wanting to learn about the electrocardiogram in some time. And this gives this image tells you a lot of uh, idea regarding how the action potential is going to travel, depolarization, repolarization is going to travel, and at the same time, this also tells you a lot of idea about how the coronary blood flow is distributed. So, if you start with the coronary blood flow, will start at the epicardium and it will move towards the endocardium, right? So, start from the epicardium, move towards the endocardium. So, this is the coronary blood flow. So, that is the reason you might be thinking that endocardium. Sorry for that. So you might be thinking that uh, endocardium is the uh, most uh, deepest portion, so most farther away from the blood supply from the epicardium. So that must be the most ischemic. No, not really, because we know that uh, heart is filled with blood. So it's a chamber that is filled with blood. So if it's going to be a chamber that is filled with blood, the endocardium is going to directly receive the blood supply from the uh, blood that is actually present within the chambers of the heart itself. So this is going to be it. So this is the endocardial portion I'm highlighting. So there, the blood supply is going to, I mean, uh, be not much significant, but the chamber blood itself is enough to perfuse this particular area. So that's not a big deal at all. So that comes to a conclusion that this particular area, that is the 
subendocardial location where the conduction fibers are present in the subendocardial portion and that's going to be the most vulnerable portion for ischemia so why it is the most vulnerable portion because it is the most farthest away from the blood supply at the same time it is not supplied by the i mean cannot be perfused by the blood that is found in the ventricular wall i mean uh, ventricular cavity itself so that is going to have a lot of trouble so that is why we always tell that the sub endocardial portion which i'm going to write here is going to be the most vulnerable portion for ischemia because it's farther away from the blood supply from the epicardial vessels and at the same time it cannot be uh, perfused properly by the uh, cavity blood also in the first place so blood supply epicardium to endocardium most vulnerable portion for ischemia is the subendocardial location and at the same time if you see the conducting fibers are basically present uh, in the subendocardial location as we know that and if you really know uh, how the deportation is going to progress it's very simple it's going to go, move from the endocardium to the epicardium because the conducting fibers are basically present in the subendocardial portion only so if you want to know how the depolarization wave is going to travel it's going to start from the endocardium and it's going to move into the epicardium and repolarization will be reverse we know that i mean depolarization if you take its positive repolarization is negative if you take depolarization as a zero repolarization is going to be one so they are binary zero one plus minus north pole south pole they are like opposite so if the depolarization is going to begin from endocardium and it's going to end in epicardium so then the repolarization is going to travel in opposite direction from the epicardium back into the endocardium so let me write d here for depolarization and let me write r here for repolarization fine all right so we are very clear about this fact so let me draw the sinus of alsalva uh, so if you really know you know like you have the iota here so let me draw the iota this is the aortic root to be honest and if you take uh, the aortic valve so it's not really like this but some are like this you know like you have three cusps of the aortic valve but because it's a two dimensional structure which i'm drawing i can show only the two cusps so let me now incise the aorta so now i'm trying to show you better i'm going to cut the aorta in the center and open the aorta so if i cut and open the aorta what's going to happen here so the aorta will open up like this like a sheet so because it's a tubular structure i'm cutting in the center opening out like a flap so now it's becoming a sheet like structure now i can see in two dimension all the three cusps so of course you are going to have something called a left coronary cusp you are going to have something called a right coronary cusp and of course you are going to have something called a non coronary cusp uh, this is the three cusps of the aortic valve now when i'm going to remove this valves i am remove this removing this valves once i remove this valves behind the aorta i'll be having some depressions behind the valves left over i mean when i remove the valves or when i see behind the valves i'll be having some pockets of depressions and these pockets of depressions is what i'm going to call it as something called a sinus of valsalva in the first place so from this sinus of valsalva only you are going to get the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery so from this area is where i'm going to get the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery of course from the non coronary sinus i'll not be getting any coronary artery which is also something to be noted i will not be getting anything from the non coronary cusp that's why the name came it's a non coronary cusp so now we know like uh, lca and rca receive blood supply both during systole as well as the diastole and it's not that uh, the blood flow is happening only during systole but if you take the left coronary artery the blood flow is predominantly happening in the diastole not in the systole but for right coronary artery it's not the same so how is that important so why we need to know that the left coronary artery uh, uh, you know like predominantly fills during diastole the first question is why so let us go back to the image what we have discussed previously in this image i have told you that uh, if you want to zoom in and see i have told you that uh, the penetrating vessels the microcirculation is basically penetrating the myocardium and they are supplying the Uh, myocardium and the subendocardial portion basically from the epicardial surface so if you really want to know that uh, you know like why it's happening so let us assume that the myocardium is contracting now so if the myocardium is contracting if it's shortening so these vessels are going to get uh, compressed under the contracting myocardium so once they are going to compress under the contracting myocardium they are really going to get compressed during systole and this compression will increase the resistance in the epicardial vessels because it's like an obstruction during systole and that increase resistance is the one that reduces the flow during the systole 
But during the diastole, the myocardium is nice and relaxed. Your blood flow can happen easily. So that's how you know, like uh, uh, the blood flow is going to have more resistance for flow during the systole. And why the left ventricle? I mean, left coronary artery is having more resistance because left coronary artery is predominantly concerned with uh, supplying the left ventricle, which is having relatively more muscle mass. And because it has more muscle mass, just hold on. I'll just uh, reduce the sounds. Okay, now it's fine. So because the left ventricle is having relatively more muscle mass, so they're going to produce more magnitude of contraction and more powerful contraction because of that. The compression or the you know, like the resistance to blood flow during systole will be more for the left coronary circulation that is supplying the left ventricle compared to the right coronary circulation, which is going to supply the right ventricle, which is having a thinner muscle and a lesser resistance so that the blood flow will happen better during systole for the right coronary circulation compared to the, of the left coronary circulation. Let us move back and see in what way all these things are going to be really, really important. So, I mean, usually you would have heard that left, left ventricular failure is going to be the most significant. So whenever left ventricular failure happens, automatically your right ventricular failure also will happen and together it will be called as something called a congestive cardiac failure. So why whenever LVF happens, RVF also happens? So I mean, within a short period of time. The reason is very simple because uh, once LVF fails, the systole will drop. So once left ventricular failure happens, so the LV systole will be weak and there'll be reduced LV systole or a weaker LV systole. Whenever you have a weaker LV systole, they are going to have reduced systolic flow and the stroke volume will reduce. If they reduce the systolic flow, the most important vessel that is dependent on systole and diastole equally is the right coronary artery. And you're going to affect right coronary artery in a great deal because there's going to be reduced systolic flow. And now you are going to result in right ventricular failure as well. So this is how whenever you have a left ventricular failure over a period of time, uh, you will be encountering uh, a right ventricular failure as well because the reduced flow during the systole and that will reduce systolic blood flow into the coronary arteries. And especially the right coronary arteries principally dependent on the systolic blood flow. I mean, not principally, but 50-50. So it's more dependent on the systolic flow compared to the left coronary artery. And that's why over time, the right ventricle also fails because of ischemia. So you can have an isolated right ventricular failure, but you cannot really have an isolated left ventricular failure for a longer time. Unless until it's a very acute and a reversible cause, you will not be really having a left ventricular failure alone for a longer time, but you can have a right ventricular failure alone due to various other causes like pulmonary embolism or uh, pulmonary hypertension, which is happening for a longer run. So there are a lot of applications with regards to uh, our understanding on the coronary blood flow. And we know and we have really understood how these arteries are winding up around. But let us recap and see what are the uh, supply to the different portions of the ventricles. So let us first start with the left ventricle. So if you take the left ventricle, uh, it's divided into anterior wall. Then uh, you can think about the apex of the left ventricle. Then you have your posterior wall of the left, lateral wall of the left ventricle. And finally, I can talk about the posterior wall of the left ventricle. Then you have the inferior wall of the left ventricle as well. As far as the right ventricle is concerned, so right ventricle once again has an inferior wall. Inferior wall is uh, something that is resting on the diaphragm. So that's what we're going to call it as an inferior wall. So then it is going to have a right ventricular free, free wall. Or this is also referred to as anterior wall of the right ventricle by someone. And um, you have some other areas which is not important. And we have the AV node and the SA node which we'll be discussing later on. Now, so as far as the anterior wall is concerned, of the left ventricle, it will be principally supplied by the left anterior descending artery, especially by the diagonal branches. We know that. And as far as the apex of the left ventricle is concerned, once again, it will be predominantly supplied by the left anterior descending artery, which we have seen already, and which is also supplied by the diagonal branches. And as far as the left ventricular, I mean, uh, the lateral wall is concerned, LWH stands for the lateral wall. It will be predominantly supplied by LAD, and to a large extent by LCX as well. If you ask what are the branches of LCX that supply the lateral wall, typically the obtuse marginal branches of the uh, you know, like uh, left circumflex branch. And then you have the posterior wall. Posterior wall uh, is a little different, so it can be supplied by the left circumflex and to an extent by the right coronary artery as well. So through the posterior left ventricular branches. So if you ask, how, I mean, what is the branch of the right coronary artery that's going to supply the uh, posterior wall? So these are called as posterior left ventricular branches, which I've told you very clearly. So that's called PLV, posterior left ventricular branches. 
and then we have the left circumflex we know to a large extent it can supply the posterior wall as well and as far as the inferior wall is concerned predominantly by the right coronary artery we know that and the uh, principal supply is through the pda that is posterior descending artery i'll tell you some anatomical variations later on so depending on where the pda is originating from but anyways pda is going to be the principal supply which principally usually happens to arise from the right coronary artery and the right ventricular free wall definitely by the right coronary artery alone and this will be done by the acute marginal branches of the right coronary artery so these are the i mean vascular supply with regards to the ventricular substance is concerned we know that but uh, the conduction fibers are completely different so we know that sa node and av node are principally supplied by the right coronary artery only suppose if i want to take the sa node uh, 60% of the times it's from the right coronary circulation but 40% of the times it can come from the left coronary circulation as well as far as the av node is concerned 40% of i mean sorry not 40 it's going to be 80% so 80% of the times it uh, originates from the right coronary artery only and only 20% of the times it's going to be coming from the left coronary artery and left coronary circulation so which, which means you know like sa node and av node principally most of the times as a common notion it's supplied by the right coronary artery only but remember your uh, bundle branches are very very different and your his purkinje system and uh, your bundle branches are completely different and they'll be supplied by different different uh, circulation so rc and lc can have both which we'll be discussing subsequently because without that also you cannot understand the ecg in the first place so i think this must be clear and we have we have left only the septal part because septum is something that is common for both the left ventricle and the right ventricle so we have to write the septum separately so septum I can divide into anterior two-third and the posterior one-third. So anterior two-third and plus the upper two-third of the septum, which is also referred to as something called the basal portion of the septum, is predominantly supplied by the septal branches of the LAD, mainly by the S1. This is the most important. So you have S2, S3 and all these things, depending on uh, what is the anatomical variation you are having. But S1 is going to be the most important that supplies the basal portion of the septum and the anterior two-third of the septum. The posterior one-third of the septum is principally supplied by the posterior descending artery. And posterior descending artery may have different, different sources. Uh, like, uh, let me tell you, depend, that, that is the one that is going to tell you the dominance as well. This must be clear. So let us recap. So anterior wall, LAD, apex, LAD, but one of the diagonal branches is going to supply the apex and the anterior wall. And the left lateral wall, uh, circumflex most importantly, but to an extent can be supplied by LAD as well. One of the diagonal branches can supply, can go a little bit lateral and they can supply the lateral wall. And the posterior wall, of course, is going to be circumflex and some of the posterior left ventricular branches from the RCA. And inferior wall, usually by the PDA, but the origin of the PDA is usually RCA, but it can be LCX as well, which we'll be discussing. And uh, right ventricular free wall or the anterior wall of the right ventricle is going to be supplied by RCA purely from the acute marginal branches. SA node, AV node, by RCA most commonly, and septum anterior two third by or the basal septum by the LAD, and the posterior one third of the septum by the right coronary circulation, typically from the posterior descending artery. So now it's time to uh, uh, really know the dominance. So what do you mean by the word dominance? Coronary dominance. Everyone will be understanding this fact. So what do you mean by the coronary dominance? Coronary dominance really means like where the PDA originates from. So that's what is going to determine the dominance. In fact, I can tell that uh, wherever PDA is originating from, plus at least one of the posterior left ventricular branch we are talking about. So I think uh, previously I've drawn something called posterior left ventricular branch, uh, which can arise from both uh, LCX as well as the RCA, but at least one posterior left ventricular branch, uh, if it originates from the RCA along with the PDA, this will be called as a right dominant circulation. And this is the most common type of dominance, which is seen in almost uh, 80 to 90 percentage of the individuals. This is the most common type of dominance, right dominant circulation, where the posterior descending artery and one of the posterior left ventricular branch at least will be originating from the uh, right coronary artery. Then we have uh, the left dominant circulation, where PDA, same, at least one of the posterior left ventricular branch will be originating from the left circumflex. So this will be called as a left dominant circulation. So this will be seen approximately seven to 10 percentage of the cases. And it's quite variable depending on the geography where you're living. And finally, there can be a situation where PDA originates from the right coronary circulation and all, not even one posterior left ventricular branch is going to originate from RC and almost all of the posterior left ventricular branches 
So note the word, all of the posterior left ventricular branches are going to originate from the left circumflex. So this kind of situation is what we refer to as something called a codominance because the posterior wall in this condition is basically supplied by both RCA as well as LCX. So you cannot really separate them. Uh, so uh, this is what we called as something called a codominance. If it's going to be a codominance, then uh, uh, if you want to know the percentage, the percentage is going to be 7 to 10, 10 percentage again. Clear? So that is what we define as something called a codominant circulation. So of course, the most common is going to be the right dominant circulation where uh, the PDA, at least one of the posterior left ventricular branches, at least one will be coming from the RCA. Left, uh, left, uh, left uh, dominant circulation will be like PDA, at least one of the posterior left ventricular branch will be originating from the LCX. And if PDA completely originates from RCA and all the posterior left ventricular branches originate from the LCX, so that situation is what we refer to as a codominant circulation, which is also the less common entity. If they ask you the least common, uh, I would generally prefer answering it as a codominant circulation. Codominant is what I believe is going to be the least common, least most common, even though uh, many guidelines clearly tell it's equal around 7 to 10 percentage as compared to the left dominant circulation. So now we know the coronary dominance as well. So usually the overlap will happen in the inferior wall and the posterior wall only. Anterior wall, you really don't have any problem because it's going to be the LAD for sure. The uh, right ventricle, once again, it's not a confusion at all because it's going to be RCA for sure, the acute marginal branches. Lateral wall, once again, even though there is an overlap, there's no confusion, it's going to be the left coronary circulation only. There is no doubt about that. Either mostly by the circumflex or rarely by the some diagonal branches can uh, curve around and they can supply the lateral wall of the LAD. So lateral wall, anterior wall, apex or left ventricle, not a problem. Right ventricle, not a problem. The usually confusion starts in the posterior wall and the inferior wall of the uh, ventricles only. Posterior wall and inferior wall has a substantial overlap in circulation because depending on where the PDA is originating from, based, I mean, uh, based on that, you, can, you have to tell like uh, what will be the predominant blood supply. For example, the left circumflex can be the dominant one in that the posterior wall and the inferior wall will be supplied by the left circumflex or very rarely, I mean, very commonly your right when right coronary artery is the one that's going to supply the posterior wall and the inferior wall predominantly. So whenever you think about an inferior wall MI, that's where your confusion is going to start because you really don't know whether what is the culprit artery when you're going to discuss on the ECG, whether it's going to be the left circumflex that's going to give rise to the problem or if it's going to be the right coronary artery that's going to give rise to the problem. So with this basic understanding, we need to know about the electrocardiogram. So I'm going to talk about the lead system in some time. So we're going to talk something called an ECG. So hope you understand this. So till now, whatever I told you, did you understand what I, what I was telling? So have you understood the coronary circulation? And uh, have you understood what you mean by the dominance? And uh, what is the direction of blood flow? Epicardium to endocardium. And what is the direction of your uh, uh, depolarization and repolarization? Of course, I think it must be fine. Okay, so then we are moving on to the ECG. So that is what we refer to as something called the electrocardiogram. So there is a difference with electrogram. So there is another entity called an electrogram. It is not uh, basically an electrocardiogram. So what is the difference? So can anyone tell what do you mean by an electrocardiogram and what do you mean by an electrogram? Uh, it's very simple to understand. Electrocardiogram is nothing but when you place the leads over the skin surface. I'm going to keep the leads over the skin surface and I measure the recordings. Um, this is what we call it as electrocardiogram. Suppose if I'm going to use an internal lead, directly I'm going to place the leads on the heart, like uh, I'm going to put a jugular vein catheter or probably even going through the IVC, not a problem. So I'm entering the right heart and from the right heart, I'm keeping leads directly in the heart and inside the heart, which means in the endocardial surface, if I'm keeping a lead and I'm finding out, so that will be called as an electrogram. So electrogram is basically different. It is something that, uh, uh, you know, like uh, where you keep the leads directly over the heart, I mean, the endocardial surface predominantly or on the epicardial surface. If you keep on the surface of the body on the skin, that is called as an electrocardiogram, ECG. So both are a little different. So don't confuse with electrogram versus electrocardiogram and uh, when you come across these kind of words in your textbooks, because you'll be encountering very often something called a his bundle electrogram, HBE. So this doesn't mean that this is a ECG. So that is completely different. So that is done invasively. Most of the times we don't really discuss on the electrogram, even though I'll try to give you some few images at the later fag end of the session. But um, electrogram is not really important for your exams because it's mostly important for the guys who are practicing 
EPS, electrophysiological studies, for them to ablate an arrhythmia, to know where an arrhythmia is originating from, to find out some accessory pathways in the heart. So this electrogram is going to be really, really important. So for radio frequency ablation, all these purposes. For all practical purposes, we need to know only about the electrocardiogram. So that is ECG. So in German, it's also called as something called EKG because their way of pronouncing, I mean, pronouncing electrocardiogram is electrocardiogram, that is EKG. So you can call it in any way, not a problem. So as far as ECG is concerned, the most important thing is to understand uh, is the paper first. Paper is what something you have to understand in the first place. So uh, the paper you're going to use, you know very well how it's going to look like. But let me uh, tell you, it's going, you, it's going to have multiple squares and it's going to run at a particular speed. So for example, if somebody asks you what is the speed of the ECG paper, it is absolutely variable. It is not a constant speed at all. You can change it. Yes, but for Indian practice and uh, for majority of the other Western countries like UK, US, everyone follows a speed of 25 millimeters per second, which means it should not be the only thing. Even there are certain countries like uh, certain parts of Russia and Germany, especially uh, they use the EK, I mean ECG paper at a speed of 50 millimeters per second. So it all depends on how you are tuned to. So we Indians are currently tuned to 25 millimeters per second. And that's really, really important. And the most important thing that you have to look in the ECG before you start with any reading is the calibration, whether it is correct or not. And at the same time, apart from the speed, you also do have something called the voltage. So you're going to see that as well, the voltage reflections. So this is also really, really important because um, usually one millimeter is equal to 0.1 millivolt. And that should be the case. And that should be absolutely true. And that should really happen. And uh, that is why uh, both these things, if they are correct, you have to really note about the calibration. They don't have to start even seeing the ECG in the first place. So don't uh, unnecessarily uh, get into trouble unless and until you see this. So let me draw the paper in probably some other way. So if you take the ECG paper, it's going to be divided into multiple, multiple lines like this. So let me draw. So these are going to be the boxes within the ECG. We know that. Okay, so these are the, I mean, it's a perfect square, of course, I'm just drawing. So if, if I talk about this one large box, so let us assume this is a large box that you're seeing, one box. And if you zoom it and see, it's going to have uh, its own small boxes within it. So if I draw this, I'm going to, if I zoom it and push it out a little bit, so this itself is going to have certain small boxes. So my idea is to find out what is the length of the small boxes and calibrate it accordingly. So, so this is what I'm zooming now. So this itself is going to have a lot of boxes inside it. So if I'm going to put on the paper, so this is going to be the X axis and this is going to be the Y axis for sure. So as far as the X axis is concerned, so it is basically denoting the time. You have to know that. And uh, as far as the Y axis is concerned, it's going to predominantly denote the voltage reflection. Clear? So that's the one that is important to understand as well. So if you uh, see the x-axis, we know that one millimeter is the length of course. And since this is a perfect square, even in the y-axis, the length is going to be one millimeter. So that's not going to change. So one millimeter is the standard and that's going to be the length as well as the height as well. So, and the breadth as well, because this is a perfect square. But what you are going to measure in that one millimeter is completely different because in the x-axis, it's a variable that is a time. In the y-axis, it's a variable that is the voltage that you're going to measure here. So in the x-axis, this one millimeter may not represent the same thing as that of the y-axis. So to find out how much uh, time this one millimeter will contribute to, so we can see the speed of the ECG paper, we know speed is 25 mm per second. So let me put a simple derivation. So if one second, your paper is running at 25 millimeter speed, so which means in one second, it would have run 2.5 centimeters or 25 millimeter. So I need to know in one millimeter, how much time would have traversed, which means in one small box, this area, how much time would have traversed? That's what I wanted to know. So one millimeter will be equal to one twenty-fifth of the second. So which means I can write one millimeter is equal to 0 0.04 seconds, basically. And or I can write alternately, if you're good in math, I can write even 40 milliseconds. I mean, which means uh, if you want to get in milliseconds, you just multiply by thousand. So I'm going to get 40 milliseconds. So that's the time that is going to elapse with one millimeter of the travel of the ECG paper in the X axis. So that's something very important to understand. And we also know that uh, in the y-axis, one millimeter 
will be basically denoting something called 0.1 millivolt. So that's straightforward. That's why I told you in the initial phase, that's a calibration. One millimeter must be equal to 0.1 millivolt. And this can be changed as well. It's not a big deal to change. It just you have to change some inputs in the ECG machine. That's all. Apart from that, it's very easy to change. Then, uh, I mean, so let us assume that if you take a five millimeter, uh, you know, like in the height, so it's going to be five mm. So which must be equal to 0.5 millivolt. That's understandable. And if you take in the X axis, the same five millimeter must be equal to something else. It's time basically. So 0 0.04 multiplied by five must be 0.2 seconds. Or if you're good in math, you can also multiply by thousand and you can write as 200 milliseconds. So one large box in X axis is equal to 200 milliseconds or 0.2 seconds. And one large box in Y axis must be equal to 0.5 millivolt. So this is the basic calibration and this should be at your fingertip. Even before you start, this is really, really important. So you have to know about the ECG paper first. So once we have understood about the ECG paper, then next step is to understand the lead system because this is what you're going to place. The lead system is really, really important. And before going to the lead system, let me uh, check uh, whether everything is going all right. Just hold on. So I need to check once. Okay. Things are all right. because I need to upload it as well. Yeah, so I need to upload it as well. So that's why I wanted to just uh, check once that everything is all right and it's getting recorded. So this, this session has to be uploaded later on. Okay, all right. Okay, so so we have to know about the lead system. So what are the leads that um, are going to contribute to the, the, I mean, functioning of the electrocardiogram or the analysis of the electrocardiogram. So to understand the leads, you need to know who are the first person to discover the ECG in the first place. We know it is someone who is going to be called as Dr. Willem Eindhoven. He is the one who is called as the father of the EKG or the ECG. So now you'll be thinking about a lot of fathers. So who's the father of EEG for that matter? So if somebody asks you who's the father of EEG, you should be spontaneously telling one thing. So is Hans Berger. So he's the father of EEG. So ECG is of course, it's Willem Eindhoven. And um, you might be needing to know who's the father of the stethoscope, who invented stethoscope, or probably who discovered stethoscope. Yes, it's René Lenac or Ray Lenac. He's a French physician. So he's the one who uh, discovered the stethoscope and uh, who discovered BP apparatus, your mercury sigma manometer. Mercury sigma manometer, who's the one who uh, invented or probably discovered the mercury sigma manometer, which you use even now in the 21st century after 200 years. His name is Raiva Rossi. So Raya Rose is the one who invented the Mercury Sigma manometer. And you have a lot of other discoveries like this. For example, if you ask uh, in the BP, who's the person who invented the systolic component, that the systolic component is existing. His name is Carl Potain. You have a lot of other signs like Potain sign. Clear? Potain has a lot of contribution to the cardiology. Like, for example, he's the one who told the opening snuff of mitral stenosis. And... Uh, who's the one who discovered that diastolic BP can be measured. At that time, they know that diastolic BP is there, but they don't know how to measure it. His name is Ivan Korotkov. So that's why you call it as Korotkov sounds. So where you can measure the diastolic blood pressure. So you have a lot of uh, people who contribute to the cardiology and at the same time, a lot of people who have contributed to other sections as well. So some of the questions that will be asked in your exam. So this has been some old questions in 2016, 17 and all this stuff. So where they used to ask the uh, names of these people as well. So right now, I don't think these kind of questions will be there. But anyways, let us uh, discuss something about what Willem, I mean, Willem Eindhoven has done to the electrocardiogram. 
So basically, we know that uh, we can draw triangles. Every time you see this kind of stuff, I have to draw a triangle. So let me try to put, I mean, rotate it. I don't think it's getting rotated. So I have to draw it manually. So this is a kind of a triangle that you will get uh, uh, when you see a will, I mean, I'm the one's triangle. So this is going to be the right arm. We know that. So this is what I'm going to see from here to here to here. So it's like an iron man sort of a triangle, but uh, you know, like it's a bigger one that's all so this is going to be on the left arm and this is going to be on the foot typically on the left foot maybe or left lower limb so i can write as ll typically on the left lower limb i think uh, i'll uh, stop and check once because uh, i've been instructed to do so just hold on we'll be starting in a due time <laughs> 